Hello everybody, my name is Fortifier and welcome to episode 13 of the Ready Go Gaming Show. Today, we're going to be talking about SNK. I knew this day would come. For those of you who don't know, I have a very strong love-hate relationship with everything that SNK has ever put out. Recently, SNK has been fingering my asshole. It's been a very naughty boy. Very, very naughty boy. I don't like SNK very much, but I'm going to keep my, I'm going to keep my wits about me. Keep my wits about me. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna talk bad about SNK. This is an educational video for the future of America. I'm not gonna talk about you know how much of a cash grab they've been over the course of the last 20 years. I'm not gonna talk about just how brutally difficult some of these games are. No, <laughs> we're gonna be nice about it. Be grand. Yeah, that's how it fucking works, don't it? Before my frame's even done, because you block everything, you get to get a free hit on me. Now you're touching my titties. You know what? Fuck it. You want to know what I think about SNK? I'll fucking it. This episode is dedicated to a company that Forte really doesn't like in any capacity. One that has repeatedly rustled his jimmies, stolen his quarters, and taken his virginity. For this reason, please don't be surprised if any random vulgarity comes from those in the peanut gallery, despite the fact that Forte does not have an active speaking role in this episode. This has been a public safety announcement from your friendly producers here at the Ready Go Gaming Show. And that's all I've got to say about that. Rant over. But anyway, I'm not going to be talking on this episode at all. I try to distance myself from the video so that other people can talk about these amazing companies that pretty much molded our childhoods. For me, SNK was a huge deal in the arcades. They were awesome. They are the quintessential arcade name for the mid-90s. I'm sorry, there's really no replacement for it. There's they just kicked ass. They kicked ass. But anyway, we got three guest speakers on today's episode. The first up is Ace Gaming LPs. I call him Ace. He is the producer for this uh, episode. He's also an assistant producer for the Ready Go Gaming Show team. I'm looking forward to seeing him do some of the other projects that we have planned, such as Generations and RGGS Special. Uh, that'll be coming out over time. Just keep your eyes open and you'll see it. Ace is a retro streamer. He does a lot of awesome stuff and you should definitely check him out. He's a great friend, personal friend in real life and on Twitch. He's a really good dude. The second is Lazarus DS. Lazarus is the script editor for the show. Uh, he came in clutch for a lot of Japanese knowledge because I don't speak Nippon language or karate and I, I, I just like Pocky. Well, I don't speak it, you know? It's an acquired ability. Laz is not only on my stream team, well not really mine, Mr. Scoot's stream team, uh, the console council, he's also a retro streamer, fantastic guy, uh, loves everything Japanese, actually lives in Japan, so he's immensely helpful when that time comes. You should definitely check him out too. And finally we have Three Bears Gaming, well more specifically one particular person in Three Bears Gaming, Herb, 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 Herb. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it. Anyway, Three Bears Gaming consists of three different people, Lucas, Pete, and Herb, or Herb. I don't know how to pronounce it, because I'm fucking dumb. But anyway, Herb wanted to talk about this, and I was like, hell yeah, definitely. He was really interested in being part of a documentary series. And by the way, if you want to check out an amazing stream, three-way, check out Three Bears Gaming. It's spelled exactly as you would think, okay? Cool. But anyway, Herb likes to do DDR and all these other things, and he's probably cringing at the fact that I can't pronounce his name right. And I'm sorry! I'm only a boy. I'm only a boy. Check out all of these guys, and if you're watching this on YouTube, all of their links will be down in the description. And that's enough out of me. Let's go ahead and kick back, talk about SNK from start to finish, and I guess I'll see you on the other side. SNK, Shin Nihon Kikaku, the New Japan Project, Reaper of Childhood Dreams and Hard Earned Quarters. The legendary company that brought the arcade home, literally. A memorable organization that provided some of the best memories many of us 90s kids have from our childhood. For those of us who didn't play Galaga or Outrun in the arcades, we ran into Metal Slug, or maybe even Fatal Fury if we were lucky, or unlucky, depending on what you think about it. But we know of SNK now, and their presence in the industry. But where did it all begin? And what are they up to now? SNK was brought into existence in 1973, a time where video games were practically non-existent. But this was also a time where many of the greats would come into the industry, such as Taito, Hudson Soft, Konami, and even Sega. In this era, all of these companies began their legendary journeys to building our childhoods one pixel at a time. Eikichi Kawasaki, while living in Osaka, decided to begin developing both software and hardware for various different enterprises. But remember, this is the 70s, and the golden age of the arcade was on the horizon. 
So Mr. Kawasaki thought he would stick his toes in that pool and see what he could create. Well, before they did that, they took the mouthful of Shin Nihon Kikaku and simply abbreviated it to SNK. Anyway, it was time to make a game, and this game would be known as Ozma Wars. It was a vertical shoot-em-up that screams 1970s and has one of the most annoying soundtracks known to mankind outside of 1942. Just listen to this. Oh my god, that's terrible. The next game release would be Safari Rally, which mostly looked like a copy clone of Head On, if Head On was strictly vertical. Both titles were novice attempts at creating games, and in comparison to other titles in the late 70s to early 90s, they really weren't up to snuff. Then they released Vanguard in 1981, which was the first game SNK created that reached notoriety, and in a good way. It played a lot like Scramble, a title which you might not have heard of, which was Konami's take on the side-scrolling shooter and the father of Gradius. Vanguard was a nifty title, though, and was quite playable compared to the last two games. It had primitive voice acting and used mechanics that predated Salamander, known as Life Force in America. In particular, this meant that you could fly sideways, diagonal, and vertical in a controlled space. This title received Atari exclusive ports for the 2600 and the 5200 that were incredibly successful. With Vanguard reaching rapid success not only in the arcade, but also on the Atari, it was the boost that SNK needed to finance another division. Thus, they created SNK Electronics Corporation in America, led by a man called John Rao, and thus began their legacy of arcade titles that will always be remembered throughout history. The early 80s was a turbulent time in America. Some of you might recall the video game crash of 1983, where oversaturation of the market led to many great companies closing their doors. But Japan was not impacted by this nearly as much as we were in the West. Nintendo alone was one of the strongest companies to survive this time in gaming history, and they had a little trick up their sleeve. The Famicom, known in the US as the NES. Now the kicker for Nintendo is that unlike Sega, they allowed third-party developers to thrive, but in a controlled setting. Under Nintendo's seal of quality, developers could make a limited amount of entries per year, which kept the market safe from saturation. SNK would be granted the privilege of being a third-party developer by 1985, but they didn't act on it right away. During this year, they also opened up another branch called SNK Home Entertainment. Remember John Rowe, the president of SNK America? This was the year he decided to leave SNK America to form Trade West, but still kept a close relationship to SNK, leading the way for Paul Jacobs to become the president of both US components at the time. We're now in the mid 80s. SNK is rocking in Japan, and both SNK Electronics Corporation and SNK Home Entertainment are living the American dream. In between the early 80s and where we are now in the timeline, various arcade entries were developed and released. This includes titles such as Marvin's Maze, Mad Crasher, Main Event, and the less successful sequel to Vanguard, Vanguard 2. Another noteworthy entry for SNK at this time would be Alpha Mission, known in Japan as ASO, Armored Scrum Object. From 1979 to 1986, SNK would release 23 arcade titles, but in 1987, the Famicom and the NES would rise in popularity. And what do you do when a new system comes out? Well, you make games for it. I mean, all the cool kids were doing it, taking their arcade games and porting them to this fancy new great box. And if Capcom and Konami did it, why couldn't SNK? And that's exactly what they did, releasing ports of Ikari Warriors, not only for the NES, but for every fucking console under the sun. Two specific NES exclusive titles would also be made for the NES by SNK. Baseball Stars in 1989, as well as Chrysalis in 1990. Plus the Genesis and the TurboGrafx-16 were coming out, and oh shit, it's time for a console war! Hell yeah! Here's the funny part. SNK didn't give a shit about any of that. In fact, they couldn't have cared less. They focused more on the arcade spectrum than the home console market into the 90s, but they did also have two other companies to do their dirty work. Romstar, a video game company out of California, and Takara. 
<laughs> oh, Takara, a toy company making games. What could possibly go wrong? What possibly on this planet could go wrong if you ask a toy company to make video games? So for a TLDR, SNK was focused on the arcade and their home entertainment division was handled by Takara and Romstar. Oh, and also ironically, Tiger Electronics, but it seems like everyone was relying on Tiger back then since they were apparently a cost-efficient option. And SNK and the arcade? They were about to power fuck our brains with an innovation unlike anything any other company had at the time, the Neo Geo. If you want something new, you have to stop doing something old. This is a quote by Peter F. Drucker, some guy who said something interesting and now Fort put his quote in the script. I can see the potential though. Nice job, Fort. I'm proud of you. Innovation, huh? Well, yeah, SNK was innovative. Since the beginning of the arcade era, you only had one game in each cabinet, and these were all mass produced. But SNK had a different idea. What if they had one cabinet and it was used for multiple games? Enter the Neo Geo MVS or Multi Video System. This is an arcade cabinet that contained not just one, not two, not three, four, or even five, but six different games installed. Plus, the games are really cheap compared to the average cost of buying a new cabinet or reconfiguring an old one for another game. Neo Geo was just a great concept, and the entirety of the 90s, it absolutely ruled the arcade. A majority of the franchises we'll be covering today were born on the Neo Geo. They were replicated, duplicated, put in anthologies, placed in Pizza Huts, you name it, it happened. Then they wanted to bring the Neo Geo home. This was done by the way of the AES, or Advanced Entertainment System, a direct method of bringing home these fantastic arcade titles to the comfort of your living room, and all for the low, low cost of $649.99. Wait a minute, that's not a low cost. That's expensive as fuck. In 1991, that was so much money. In today's dollars, after inflation, that's $1,304.55, holy fuck. Anyway, the AES paralleled the MVS, and if you couldn't afford that, you could always opt to buy the Takara and Romstar ports of famous MVS titles instead. For instance, Fatal Fury, which was on the Genesis, Super Nintendo, and Sharp X68000, as well as the Neo Geo CD, a CD-based console that retailed for $400. They even talked mad shit like Sega to other people, saying you needed a pair of these to play one of these. SNK was on their shit in the 90s. I mean, why not? They were making a shit ton of money by power fucking you out of quarters. But that wouldn't be the end of Neo Geo. It was rebranded and reproduced multiple times on various different formats. So let's go over them, shall we? We've already covered the MVS and the arcades, and we've also talked about the AES, the home console that was essentially a consoleized MVS that takes an act of God to be able to afford to collect nowadays. Next came the Neo Geo CD, which suffered slightly from long load times, but was essentially the same as the previous two. In addition to the CD, they created a lesser-known arcade expansion by the name of the Hyper Neo Geo 64, which supported 3D rendering. However, SNK only produced seven games for it during its tenure in the arcades. We'll be talking about games on hardware a bit later. SNK also produced the Neo Geo Pocket as well as the Pocket Color, both with limited libraries, and both of which fell short of expectations when compared to Nintendo and Sega handhelds released at the time. From 1988 all the way up to 2001, the Neo Geo thrived before coming to a sudden end. Ultimately, the arcade spectrum fell short around this time and the Neo Geo faded into obscurity. But not before the unexpected release of the Neo Geo X in 2012, a handheld with 20 built-in games and 5 expansion cards you could add. It was pretty cool, and for 200 bucks it wasn't that bad of a deal. But unfortunately SNK seemed to put most of its chips on the Neo Geo, and when that stopped being popular, profits started heading downhill. With the Neo Geo a memory of the past, SNK wasn't doing very well. By the year 2000, their losses were simply too much to handle and they looked at either selling their company or declaring bankruptcy. Luckily in Japan, pachinko games are all the rage. Why? Gambling's illegal here, and pachinko's the closest thing people can get to it. And pachinko parlors are often connected to arcades anyway. So, SNK took a page from Sega's book. Back then, Sega talked to Sammy Holdings to keep their business afloat by using pachinko parlors. So SNK did the same thing with Aduze. Aduze was known to make pachinko machines that utilized popular IPs, but it still wasn't paying the bills. And then, 
a joint venture with Capcom led to a minor success for a small franchise of games called Capcom vs. SNK. They were great games, but it still wasn't enough. In 2000, SNK of America was closed, and ever so slowly SNK was dissolving. Programmers and developers left for other popular video game companies like Capcom. But also, three brand new companies were formed. Brezza Soft, Playmore, and Dimps. Brezza Soft was the result of a small group of SNK employees banding together to keep the flames of Neo Geo alive, and managed it for the most part. Dimps would be known for a large number of Dragon Ball Z fighting games like the Budokai series and a bunch of good Sonic games too. But Playmore was a power move from the creator of SNK, Akiki Kawasaki, essentially pressing the reset button on his business ventures. SNK was a sinking ship, but Playmore, it slowly took many of the former SNK employees and rehired them. SNK went bankrupt and was rebought by Playmore. How does that even work? Fuck up a company, make a new company, and buy the fucked up company retaining all IPs that weren't given away like candy at Halloween? This is like some Martha Stewart shit. Also during this time, the rest of Playmore's subsidiaries were acquired. For example, Noise Factory and ADK, which we'll cover in a second. With the purchase of SNK, Playmore was rebranded SNK Playmore, and the rest is history. The future of this company isn't very well known, but Neo Geo era titles are still kicking ass in anthologies and online shops for modern consoles. And while the company is merely a shadow of its former self, many of us still find ourselves going back and playing these memorable titles. Also, the new Samurai Showdown is awesome. Now it's time to talk briefly about some of the subsidiaries before we dive into some of the popular franchises for SNK. Most modern games by SNK were indeed created by the three main subsidiaries, so let's check them out, starting with ADK. ADK stands for Alpha Denshi Corporation. Why is the K there? I have no clue. Maybe they really liked Mortal Kombat and wanted to change the C to a K? Well, no, they started out simply Alpha Denshi, but eventually added Kabushiki Kaisha. Uh, Laz? Help me out here, buddy. Kabushiki Kaisha means roughly share company in English. It refers to a company that has shares they sell to shareholders. In English, companies like this are often referred to by the distinction of incorporated or corporation. Huh, well, there you go. You learn something new every day. Now then. Alpha Denshi started out as a telecommunications company making arcade titles as early as 1980 with Dora Chan and Shogi, with Dora Chan using an unlicensed version of the famous Japanese franchise Doraemon, and that led to lawsuits, so <laughs> great start! Great start? More like work of art, more like pain in my ass. Doraemon is stupid. He's blue. He's dumb. He's stupid. It's stupid. I've only ever played one Doraemon game. It was on the Famicom, and it was fucking dumb. Fucking dumb. I didn't like it very much. It's dumb. Look at that sperm on the side. Smiling dog. Pissed off lion. Meth cat. What am I driving a buggy around? Doraemon makes no sense. It never will. But somehow, somehow, it's a national treasure. I even got candy with this idiot's name on it. I went to a store that was nothing but Doraemon, and I wanted to shit on the counter. See? Told you. Fuck Doraemon as much as Billy Khan. Whoa. Anyway, they didn't let the lawsuits keep them down. I made a few more unremarkable games such as Crush Roller, Exciting Soccer, and some baseball games. But they really weren't well known until 1987, when they started developing titles for SNK hardware. The first contribution would be Magician Lord. This 1990 side-scrolling action platform title was a launch title for the MVS as well as the AES, featuring gameplay highly reminiscent of other titles such as Alter Beast, Rastan, and Ghouls and Ghosts. It was unique and sold well, as did the next title, Ninja Combat. And finally, World Heroes, which was essentially a copy clone of Street Fighter 2, but was kinda different. Over time, ADK followed the same fate as SNK, but they're still kicking, just not as well as before, even if they only had about the three major titles since. This one is simple. Noise Factory was a development company that started with the beat-em-up Gaia Crusaders before being acquired by SMK to make the later iterations of Metal Slug, the King of Fighters franchise, and more. But outside of that, they've recently been helping SMK and Atlas both do some simple games that aren't really much to talk about. Oh well. Ever heard of Irem? That's the company that brought us gems on the NES such as Ten Yard Fight, Metal Storm, Holy Diver, and uh, Deadly Towers. 
And if you really go back in gaming history, you can probably remember Irem for releasing some exceptionally successful arcade titles such as Moon Patrol, Kung Fu Master, and the highly popular shoot 'em up franchise R-Type. Well, Irem was great and all, but many people working for Irem felt that they weren't. In fact, there was a period where they kind of just vegged out for a little bit, and that was enough for various people to break away and form their own little development squad. That's where Nazca Corporation comes in. But to start with, they didn't have an official title for their little ragtag group. And it wasn't long before they wound up working on a few games for Irem, such as R-Type 2, Air Duel, and finally Gun Force 2. After they were officially done with Irem, they renamed themselves Nazca, and in 1996 were acquired by SNK. You might not recognize this name, but you certainly will recognize the series they created, Metal Slug. Metal Slug 1, 2, and 3 would be developed by the former members of Nazca, but they also worked on a golfing masterpiece called Neo Turf Masters. Neo Turf Masters is the greatest golf game ever made in the history of mankind. There will never be a better golf game, I'm sorry. Tiger Woods. I'm sorry, Hot Shots. I'm sorry, Lee Trevino's fighting golf. You failed. Give up. Neo Turf Masters rules. It's a very simple, beautiful game. Pick your golfer. They all have different stats. I go for the technician, uh, aka Mark Wahlberg, aka Bill Gates, aka Bill Wahlberg Gates. He looks like both of them. Don't tell me he doesn't. Look at him. Look at that beautiful face. Oh, he's so happy. You have four courses to choose from, with the easiest one being Germany up to the very, very difficult Australia course. It's got some serious par fives on it with some wicked dog legs. I just like saying dog legs. That's a golf term. Don't look it up. It's real. I, I didn't make it up. I promise I did not make up dog legs. I've made up a lot of other things, but certainly not that. The game just has everything going for it. Amazing music, amazing atmosphere. Uh, the game puts me right at ease. I find myself pulling this one off the shelf to play over and over again. Play this game any way you can if you enjoy golf. Neo Turf Masters! Now then, let's take a look into some of the SNK franchises that were pumped out throughout the years. There are many MVS titles, but we aren't here to cover them all. As per the norm from we discuss franchises, these are titles that were developed and published by SNK or their subsidiaries. There aren't that many, but they're still very interesting to talk about. Let's begin. Alpha Mission is a vertical shoot-em-up which was ported to the Famicom in 1986 and the NES a year later. It's a run-of-the-mill vertical shooter, highly reminiscent of titles such as Zevius but with some extra sprinkles on top. There's also a sequel with Alpha Mission 2 in 1991 that looks and plays infinitely better. Check them out if you enjoy shoot-em-ups. Unfortunately, we haven't seen anything outside of re-releases for this franchise in a long time. What do you get if you want to crudely copy Street Fighter's homework but only slightly change it? You get Art of Fighting, featuring two students, Ryo Sakazaki and Robert Garcia, who aren't doing so hot. You see, Ryo's sister was kidnapped by Mr. Big. That's right, the supergroup featuring Eric Martin, Paul Gilbert, Pat Torby, and Billy Sheeran, who made fantastic songs such as Take Cover and To Be With You. Uh, this Mr. Big is a person, not the band. Oh, <laughs> well then that changes everything. Anyway, these two protagonists essentially study a form of karate called Kyokugen Karate, and you kick the shit out of everyone. The point that we want to focus on is that the Art of Fighting series ties into the Fatal Fury universe, which falls under the King of Fighters universe, which in and of itself is kind of the Big Umbrella universe. Art of Fighting predates all of that in the timeline taking place in the late 70s. Funnily enough, this title is parodied a lot. Dan Hibiki from the Street Fighter universe? Yeah, he's a parody of Ryo, because Capcom felt that Ryo was literally a ripoff of Ryu, and for the most part, Capcom was right. The mechanics were kind of weird, and it was somewhat difficult to pull off special moves, but hey, they included a ton of bones levels. The next entry would be released two years later and added a key mechanic known as the Rage Gauge. Oh, hey, that rhymed. It's like the spirit system from the previous game, but I don't know if anyone ever figured out how to hell to actually use it. You can look past that, it's pretty good. Plus, this is the first game to bring in Yuri Sasaki. This is also where the King of Fighters tournament would also get its curious start by Geese Hour. Ten years later in the timeline, Fatal Fury would be taking place, so it was cool to see where it all started. Also, pay attention to some of the characters you might see. King of Fighters took many characters from the older games and brought them back, but we'll talk about that in a moment. This game was massively better than its previous title, but as expected, 
The SNK syndrome is real with this one, so it's goddamned hard. The next game would be Art of Fighting 3, The Path of the Warrior, made another two years later. This game brought the focus to Robert Garcia for once, with him looking like an old friend. But the big bad boy of the game, Wilder, is a sassy bitch and you need to kick his ass. That's pretty much a summary of how the franchise went up to this point. Oh, and there was an anime created based on the title too. It's worth checking out if you like anime about video games. This one's a bit weird. It's cute, it's gimmicky, and it's cartoony. It's Athena, also known as Athena's Wonderland. This game is a platformer created for the arcade, something you don't see too often. Most of the time, platformers in the arcade were very minimalistic, but certain titles, such as Wonder Boy or even the Versus Nintendo cabinets, had full-length titles, complete with their own plots and everything. And Athena is no exception. In this story, you play as the young princess Athena, who opened a door that is literally called The Door That Shouldn't Be Opened. And as fucking mind-blowing as that is, it leads somewhere terrible. And of course, she opens the door and fuckery's afoot. She has to navigate the evil wilderness and fight Dante. That's pretty much it. It's kind of weird though, she's practically naked, uses power kicks, and you find armor and other equipment and stuff. It's, it's weird. While Athena was an interesting addition to the SNK library, there wasn't a sequel for a while. Instead, the focus of the franchise jumped to a series known as Psycho Soldier, which was a platformer with an obnoxious-ass musical sing-along that happens in the first level. Seriously, get a load of this. You better hide if you are bad. <laughs> Between people singing and children laughing, I'm honestly not sure which is worse. The important part about Psycho Soldier is that a new protagonist was introduced, Athena Asamiya, who some of you might recognize from the King of Fighters franchise. Then we had a really strange adventure game called Athena Awakening from the Ordinary Life that is oh so dry. It's kind of hard to explain, but here we go. Imagine an adventure game on the PlayStation, released only in Japan of course, in the style of Clock Tower and Resident Evil. Except without any voice acting. Or any direction. It's not inherently a bad game, it's just weird. And not really related to anything in the Athena franchise outside of the name. And finally, there's a sequel in 2006 which was a mobile title, kept the exact same weird cutesy shit the first game was known for. It's not really that popular, but it does have its fans. And finally, Athena does make cameos in other future SNK titles as well. Baseball Stars is a baseball game. Wow. Are you shocked? I am. I thought this was an RPG. Anyway, it was an NES title of all things, and was incredibly successful. It's a simple sports game where you can earn money to upgrade your players, and it spawned quite a few sequels from its initial release on the NES and the PlayChoice 10 cabinet. While SNK worked on this one, there would be an enhancement called Baseball Stars Professional, the first Neo Geo game published ever. The sequel Baseball Stars 2 was released by Romstar in 1992, and if you know anything about SNK, when another company creates another game in an SNK franchise, they tend to totally fuck it up 30 ways to Sunday. It added slightly different mechanics, but it wasn't as successful. Also, fun fact, if you played this game in the arcade, you couldn't even play a full game without having to pop in more quarters. It's ridiculous! Imagine a 9 inning game, having to pop in quarters with the passing of every few innings. It's a total fucking cash grab! There would be two more titles released that used the engine for Baseball Stars, but one was an SNK title. The one that WAS SNK was Little League Baseball Championship Series for the NES. The title that WASN'T SNK would be Legends of the Diamond, which was a historically accurate game that involved famous baseball legends throughout history. SNK pretty much created games in every genre that they could, and in 1989 they tackled the rail shooter genre with the release of Beast Busters, with help from Hamachi, Papa and Team, and Images Design. It was strange to be honest because this is one of the few titles that were also ported to the Atari ST as well as the Commodore Amiga. It's a zombie shooting game and it's hard as hell if you don't have the reflexes of a spider monkey. You play as Johnny Justice, Paul Patriot, or Sammy Stately on their adventure to power fuck the undead into being more undead. It was kind of successful, but if you're like me, you've probably never heard of it. There was one sequel called Beastbusters Second Nightmare, which was released in 1999 for the Hyper Neo Geo 64 hardware we mentioned earlier. And if you were to hold this next to House of the Dead, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference. It's just another rail shooter, but in 3D. 
Also, there was a pocket color title released the same year called Dark Arms Beast Buster, which was an action RPG where you have to contain an outbreak of demons as the catalyst between the spirit world and the mortal world. It's only kind of okay, which is probably why you don't hear about this series anymore. Doki Doki Manjo Shimpan, or Heart Pounding Witch Investigation, is a contemporary fighting and adventure game released by SNK Playmore for the Nintendo DS. Basically, you play as a student who has to find a witch that's infiltrated your school, and you have to touch people to do it. It's kind of weird. Why do I get all the weird games? Apparently, it's just not that great of a game. In order to find out who the witch is, you have to basically frisk people down and touch them all over. What a weird fucking game. There is a sequel with Doki Doki Majo Shimpan 2 Duo, and this time, Japan made them rate the game a D, which is 17 years and up. Not quite the highest Sarah rating, but close. There was a third entry in the series called Doki Majo Plus in 2009, which is more of a remake of the first game despite being the third game in the series. I think I need a shower now. I feel kind of dirty. Now we're going to talk about one of the major cash cows for SNK, Fatal Fury. Fatal Fury 1 was released in 1991, and in universe it takes place a while after Art of Fighting, where Geese Howard is holding another King of Fighters tournament. This game was originally on the Neo Geo platform, but saw many releases outside of... Psst. Hey. Hey. Yes, what can I... Oh, hey, Scoot. Is that you? Hey, Les. I got a question for you. Yeah, what's up? Does this smell like chloroform to you? Oldest trick in the book. I'm not gonna fall for that shit. No siree. Always have a plan B, folks. Darts, $10. Dart gun, $30. Stealing Laz's thunder? Priceless. Now then, let me just take a seat. Let's dive in, shall we? Fatal Fury 1 was released in 1991 for the Neo Geo MVS, but we saw tons of re-releases for it. And when I say tons, I mean metric tons. Every system in existence saw a port of this game. It involved Terry and Andy Bogart and some idiot called Joe Higashi who tags along. This game was revolutionary. When you think of fighting games in the early 90s, you'll likely think of Street Fighter 2 or Mortal Kombat. Now, those games are great, but what made Fatal Fury stand out was that you could fight in two planes. And the special moves weren't too hard to pull off either. But that's kind of outclassed by the fact that this game and any Neo Geo title made in the early 90s were absolutely hard as fuck. If you're like me, you enjoy every single version of this game. Even the ports, which were all pretty great. But the arcade original still comes out on top. This was followed up by Fatal Fury 2 a year later, which didn't really change too much, but the game was still fucking phenomenal. I didn't really cover plot, but in the first game, spoiler alert, we yeet Geese Howard out the goddamn window and he falls to his death. The King of Fighters tournament keeps rolling with Wolfgang Krauser taking the helm and pulling some familiar faces back in, such as Billy Kane. Fuck that guy. He's an apple. Little, dirty, cheating pole wielding piece of shit. Yeah, you. I hate you. I hate you so much. You're cheating. Where did you get that stick? This is a fighting tournament. We're all using fists, pal. I hate you. This game also was ported even more than the last one. It was an absolute joy to play growing up. Hey, I, I just wanted to say that I genuinely disagree with you. This game is absolute fucking gimmicky trash. And that's not just the Billy Con fight. It's the whole goddamn game. It's a piece of shit. You want a dart too? I'll give you a fucking dart. I bought them wholesale from Amazon Brazil. I'll shoot one right up your ass. You know what? Totally understand. I've got a genuinely great track record of not having things going up my ass. So I'm just going to keep it like that. And I'm just going to I'm just going to back up. Oh, what the fuck? Did you shoot me with a tranquilizer dart? Oh, hey, morning, sunshine. Care to join us? I mean, I was here first, but yeah. Let's keep going with Fatal Fury. Fatal Fury 2 was a powerful entry in the series, but did you ever wonder what it would be like to play as the apples who had been mopping the floor with you since 1991? Well, you could with Fatal Fury Special, essentially an upgraded version of Fatal Fury 2 with some new additions to the roster. It's like they took a page from Street Fighter 2 Turbo by including boss characters and making it ultra speed. The next major release would be Fatal Fury 3, Road to the Final Victory, which picks up immediately after the last game, with the canon ending being Terry beating the ever-loving shit out of Krauser. Basically, the premise is that there's a rumor that Geese Howard's still alive, and we'll let you play the game to figure it out on your own. But trust us, it's a fantastic game. Also, remember the two-lane combat from before? 
Nah, son. Welcome to three lane combat. Some people like the new mechanic and others hate it, but it's definitely worth checking out. Then they switched it up drastically with the release of Real Bout Fatal Fury in 1995. They took the button configuration from the previous games and switched it to three buttons instead of four. They also kept the three plane fight system from the last entry. With each new entry in the franchise, SNK always made sure to upgrade two major things, fighting mechanics and graphics. For example, this game had ringouts as part of their stages. This game was highly successful and this title is believed to be one of the most balanced entries in the franchise. There would be two more Real Bout titles with a Real Bout special release in 1997, somewhat like the Fatal Fury special release many years prior, and Real Bout Fatal Fury 2 The Newcomers in 1998, which was an amazing title presented in a format that was akin to more common fighting games at the time, meaning there was only one lane to fight on, but you could sway to dodge enemy attacks. This game also had a spin-off called Fatal Fury First Contact, which was released for the Neo Geo Pocket Color. It features a character named Lao, and he's only available in versus mode. And the title nixed a bunch of characters, so you'll have to ask yourself if it's even worth playing that one at all. Then they tried to make the jump to 3D with Fatal Fury, Wild Ambition, which was on the Hyper Neo Geo 64 on the PlayStation. It was... rough. Really rough. Imagine Virtua Fighter, but instead you play as Fatal Fury characters, and that's essentially what it is. It's sluggish, blocky, and it's proof that Fatal Fury fits a particular format that should never have been changed. Luckily, they went back to their roots with Garou, Mark of the Wolves, which brought tons of new aspects into the franchise, and more importantly, jumped back to a graphical standard that made SNK massively popular in the first place. This game was hard, but it was gorgeous. Gauru is still played competitively to this day, and keeps the light of Fatal Fury burning strong. Ikari Warriors is an SNK classic through and through. It's a lot like Commando in the sense that it's a run and gun game, but it's SNK's own spin on the genre. You play as Ralph or Clark, two pivotal characters that from this one game become permanent fixtures of the SNK universe. These two appear in a multitude of other SNK titles and are referenced by other companies as well. This game was a time waster, and for 1986 in the arcades, it was well worth the time spent. It was also ported to everything possible, even having a ZX Spectrum release a year later. Many people consider this title to be one of the greatest arcade games of all time, and for good reason. It was also quite innovative as well, being one of the first popular video games to use rotary joysticks that could rotate and move around in ways normal joysticks could not. The game spawned sequels, but unless you knew a lot about the series, you've likely never heard of them. The first sequel would be Victory Road, released in 1987, which picks up directly at the ending of Ikari Warriors, and it was just as fun as the first entry. Well, uh, except the vehicles were taken out, which is fine because they were kind of clunky anyway. The final entry would be Ikari Warriors 3, The Rescue. If you were like me at the time, you were wondering where the fuck Ikari Warriors 2 was. Well, now you know. The last game was released for the arcade, NES, DOS, and the Commodore 64. Yeah, Commodore 64 in the early 90s. Sign me up, coach. Not a bad entry in the series, if I do say so myself. The series has been exceptionally quiet for quite some time, as is true for most SNK arcade titles. But this one definitely set a standard, and you should try it out. Did we mention that SNK loved making fighting games? Well, you're bound to see about two to three more on this list because that's what SNK did best. They just knew how to make fighting games, and this series was not an exception to that. In fact, this series is likely the one major series keeping the memories of SNK afloat more than anything, and is one of the few franchises that still remains incredibly relevant to this day. It all started with King of Fighters 94, taking place in the same universe of Fatal Fury. This game was unique in many ways. For starters, in contrast to traditional fighting games at the time, you could choose a team of three fighters, and which order for them to fight in. While it wasn't the Marvel vs. Capcom style of recent years, it was still a fun addition to the franchise. Plus, as a little bonus with sprinkles on top, you could play as teams that featured other SNK franchises. For example, Team Italy with Terry and Andy Bogard and Joe Higashi from Fatal Fury. Or even Rolf and Clark from Ikari Warriors. 
you would also see players from Psycho Soldier and Fatal Fury 2. It's a solid entry in the series, but it is hard as hell. King of Fighters would have a release almost every year up until 2003, but along the way we experienced various changes in mechanics. Well, sometimes. King of Fighters 95 was essentially the same game, but this time you could edit your lineup, making a custom team with your favorite characters. In King of Fighters 96, we were exposed to new characters, new techniques, and some changes to pre-existing teams. This entry also featured a dramatic change to the dodge technique with emergency evasion moves. Many people consider this entry to be where the series started getting absolutely badass. The cool thing is that SNK somehow managed to replicate that magic every year with minor changes. KOF 97 to 2001 were all fantastic titles, but by the time KOF 2002 rolled around, people were starting to get tired of the repetition. After all, KOF 98 was considered the ultimate entry in this franchise, and again, the days of the Neo Geo and the arcades were slowly drifting away. The rise of the PS1, PS2, and other consoles were becoming the more cost-effective ways of enjoying these titles. To mention every single title from this point on would be really monotonous, because again, each entry was only slightly different from the last. By the time King of Fighters Neo Wave had come out, 11 titles had been released, including a remake of the original King of Fighters 94 named Rebound. King of Fighters 2003 would be the last time a year was used in the titles, as the franchise transitioned to Roman numerals with the King of Fighters 11 in 2005. SNK did introduce some complex game mechanics such as the Dream Cancel that took some time to figure out. From that point on, there would be 8 more King of Fighters titles, with the most recent being the King of Fighters 14 in 2016. Originally it didn't do so hot, because they made a crude jump to 3D in a time where 3D fighting was already being done well by the likes of Street Fighter and Tekken. Luckily, they did revamp the graphics eventually. This series was a huge hit in the arcades, but if you haven't checked out any of the King of Fighters titles, you're definitely missing out. This game feels like SNK was banking on people playing it solely based on their name. It features players choosing one of six different monsters to beat the shit out of each other in a pseudo-isometric battle arena that involves popular cities in Japan. If you loved Godzilla, then you'll get into this title. It also had a pretty nifty two-player co-op if you wanted to beat up monsters with your friends. Here's the problem. It sucked. Badly. The controls were clunky, and to be honest, it was just a bad game. <laughs> oh, like no one could figure out how to play it bad. There would be a sequel with 1992's King of Monsters 2 that went away from the BS wrestling scheme that was in the first entry and replaced it with a traditional side-scrolling beat-em-up setup that made it much more fun than the first game. This is one of those love-it-or-hate-it kind of series. Oh yeah, I got Metal Slug. <laughs> this game is the shit. If you don't recognize Metal Slug, you've likely never ventured into an arcade in the 90s because this game was absolutely everywhere. I'm talking boy band levels of popularity. This is the quintessential run and gun title. Before we had Cuphead, we had Metal Slug. And when you think of the genre as a whole, I guarantee you, you will hear this game come up. Also, you can't walk into even the tiniest of Japanese arcades without running into some iteration of this game. Metal Slug was released in 1996, and it's also the name of the SV-001, or the Super Vehicle 001, a military vehicle heavily featured in the game. Metal Slug has two playable characters, Marco Rossi and Tarma Roving, and being an arcade game, you had as many lives as you could afford. It was just so buttery smooth. This game was so good, and it was addictive as shit. Sadly, it wasn't as popular at first. It had a ton of console ports, and the ports weren't that great. But that's a whole different story. Arcade titles are meant to make money, and this game definitely planted a seed for an awesome series to come. The next title will be Metal Slug 2, which introduced the other characters you might be familiar with, Eddie Kasamoto and Fiolina Fio Jeremy. This game had tons of new weapons, new vehicles, and was an absolute blast. But let's take a look at it from a perspective of games in the 90s. Metal Slug 2 suffered from massive slowdown issues when there were many enemies on the screen. Because of this, Metal Slug 2, again, wasn't that popular initially. With this being close to the 2000s and the Neo Geo era coming to an end, SNK could have easily stopped making Metal Slug titles here and nobody would have cared outside of a small loyal fan base. But what did they do? They remade the game, calling it Metal Slug X, and fixed everything. They gave this game a complete facelift and in only a few weeks after the original game was released. A few weeks! 
so there were actually two versions of this game floating around. Metal Slug 3 has the notorious honor of being an incredibly long arcade game, like incredibly f***ing long. It had a ton of vehicles and all the run and gun goodness you could muster. You'll just have to play it yourself to truly get a grasp on how awesome this title is. Fun fact, the console versions featured additional minigames, making a long game even longer. Sheesh. This is definitely one of the best entries in the series, though. Two years later, we were exposed to Mega Enterprise's take on the series with Metal Slug 4. But at this point, it wasn't really SNK making the title, so much as that weird resurrection of SNK as Playmore. So while it might look like a Metal Slug title, just know it really lacks any of the soul that the Metal Slug franchise had before. In fact, by looking at gameplay footage, you can clearly see that it just lags along. And Metal Slug 5 ultimately met the same fate. Imagine playing a Metal Slug game and zooming the screen out 25%. That's what Metal Slug 5 felt like it was doing. It was just strange. Plus, it was one of the last games for the Neo Geo, so ironically, in the end, the most memorable franchise on this classic format without, not with a Bane, but with a whimper. But that wasn't the end of the series. With the Neo Geo dead, it paved the way for future titles to be released in a general arcade setting, which is where 2006's Metal Slug 6 comes in. 6 was smoother, and it felt like it made a return to the original Metal Slug titles. Plus, it takes place almost three months after the events of Metal Slug 3. If you like the original series, this is the one we suggest you check out. If you really want to check out 4 and 5, that's your own choice. Metal Slug 7 would be a portable game. <sighs> The death of all great arcade entries, the handheld port. It was trash. But hey, they revised it with Metal Slug XX. Also, they used characters from Ikari Warriors, Ralph, Clark, and even Leona. Seven would be the last major release, but Metal Slug did release a few spin-offs such as Metal Slug First and Second Mission for the Pocket Color, a weird Game Boy Advance entry without Marco in it, and a bunch of mobile spin-offs. Oh well. Oh yeah, I have to mention this PS2 entry that has a cover that looks like it's from Team America World Police. It's total shit, so avoid it. SNK had games in every genre imaginable. And we already covered a vertical shmup with Alpha Mission, but what about horizontal shmups? They did that too, with Pulsar, which looks really cool. Think of it as SNK's take on R-Type. This game was fantastic. Essentially, it takes place in 2248, where humanity finally makes contact with aliens. Eight years after the initial contact on Mars, all hell breaks loose. Neptune gets Alderaan did, Jupiter gets imploded, and half of the continents on the Earth sink. Because of this, you need to pilot the Dino 246 to power fuck the aliens back to where they belong to protect the solar system. This game was awesome, especially in the market that SNK had flooded with fighting games since the 90s. Polestar was the first game on the Neo Geo to feature pre-rendered graphics. It also was the predecessor to another title called Blazing Star, which is essentially the same game, but on steroids. Hey, hey you, yeah, you, watching this. Do you like fighting games? Would you like it more if it had a sword? <laughs> yeah, you would. This game is Fatal Fury, but with blades and other sharp implements. It all started at the dawn of the Neo Geo with the 1993 release of Samurai Showdown, known as Samurai Spirits in Japan, featuring a guy with ultra 90s hair, and it was awesome. Or at least that's what the poster was like. The game had 12 different characters with their own unique backstories and weapons that would absolutely annihilate you. Because, as per usual, this game suffers heavily from SNK Syndrome. But there's something interesting about the history of this game. While it was SNK that developed the vast majority of it, there were some former Capcom developers involved as well. The game had several ports, with each version having positives and negatives. And there were also three different anime adaptations, all of which were gold. Samurai Showdown 2 would come out a year later, and was up there along with Fatal Fury and King of Fighters as the go-to entries on the Neo Geo. It was a total revision. The first game was fine on its own, but Champ Show 2? It was even more streamlined than the first entry. For example, if you got your face smashed in enough, your weapon would break for a short time. The impact this title had was monumental. The features from this title bled over to many other games, such as Street Fighter 3, 
You know the tactical parry? The one that Daigo used to dodge the onslaught during Evo way back in the day? Well, that was inspired by the parry system in Samurai Showdown 2. Shab Show 2 had really solid fighting system and is considered one of the greatest fighting games of all time. Samurai Showdown 3 Blades of Blood was released in 1995 and changed the mechanics a tad bit to include two different versions of every character, Slash and Bust. These versions represented chivalry and treachery, respectively, but the system fell a tad bit short of expectations. For many, it seemed this game wasn't as razor sharp as Sham Show 2, and the ports? Well, imagine playing this on the Game Boy. If you thought you would have a good time with that, well, well, uh, no. Not really the best place to play a port of an arcade fighting game. Samurai Showdown 4 would be released in 1996, and as was expected in traditional Neo Geo fashion, it was essentially a rehash of the last title. However, they were going up against other games at the time, such as Street Fighter Alpha 2, and another key sword fighting game called Soul Edge. You know that one, right? Soul Edge managed sword fighting much better than other games at the time that were weapon-centric, and it had jumped to 3D. Yikes. Then out of nowhere, SNK released Shinsetsu Samurai Spirits Bushido Retsuden, an RPG for the Neo Geo CD, PlayStation, and Saturn. In it, you roam around the overworld with a group of six characters, each with their own unique storylines and additional characters to meet along the way. Remember in Final Fantasy VI where Blitz moves required specific entry on the D-pad? Well, that's the entire fighting system in this title, but in RPG format instead of a fighting game. It's a fun title, but it was only released in Japan. Then, much like Fatal Fury, there was a 64 release, which, if you've been paying attention, doesn't mean Nintendo 64, it means Hyper Neo Geo 64, which means clunky subpar 3D that didn't fare so well. Samurai Showdown 64 and its sequel called Samurai Showdown 64 Warriors Rage were a thing, and both of them were absolutely garbage. Then we jumped in the Neo Geo Pocket Color for a subpar entry called Samurai Showdown 2. Did you hear the exclamation point in the title? <laughs> Was I enthusiastic enough to get that across? Uh, it's hard to speak punctuation out loud. Uh, anyway, I don't know if any of the games on the Pocket Color are honestly worth talking about. It's kind of like if Tiger Electronics and Game & Watch worked with Neo Geo to make a game. They're just ridiculously clunky and hard to enjoy, and this title was no exception. Just look at the footage. This is a real time. Real time. Then we would jump to the PS1 for Samurai Showdown, Warrior's Rage, which is a different title than the Hyper 64 edition, but looked exactly the same. And by exactly the same, I mean it looks like the baby of Sega and SNK if they did the horizontal sausage slam because the 3D characters look ripped straight out of Virtua Fighter. And if you've played Virtua Fighter, you know exactly where this is going. It's the early 2000s, more specifically 2003, and Playmore has taken over. And obviously at this point, the quality of SNK titles slowly started going downhill. Samurai Showdown 5 was... bad. It just couldn't catch the magic of the earlier entries, and even with a special release for the AES a year later of the same name, it just didn't matter. There would be four more releases for this time-cherished cult classic sword fighting title, with the first three being two simple sequels and an anthology. The most recent iteration, Samurai Showdown 2019, came out last year as a reboot, and it's a pretty good game. So. Give it a try if you really want to see the old Sham Show style finally return to the modern era. Do you like beat em ups? SNK sure does because they released many of these bad boys over the years. This one's kind of like another game they made called Gang Wars. Ah, uh, yes. Fort played Gang Wars and it power it. Poor baby. Anyway, Sengoku wasn't really all that great compared to other beat em ups at the time. By 1991, we had Growl, Captain Commando, and Final Fight, which were all infinitely better than what SNK was trying to do with this one. It's also had a minor port on the SNES that I may or may not have translated a while back. There are also two sequels called Sengoku 2 and 3 respectively, but honestly, if you're interested in this series, just buy Sengoku Anthology on PS2 or PC. Are you a fan of shooters or run-and-gun games? Well, you'll love this one then. Shock Troopers is a run-and-gun game. Shock Troopers 1 was a Jackal, Ikri Warriors, Commando sort of title, but done with the awesome SNK artwork you've come to expect. 
It's addictive as hell, as was the sequel, Second Squad, in 1998. Both of these games are fucking awesome, and you're doing yourself a disservice if you haven't played them. Imagine Metal Slug, but not side-scrolling, and you would have Shock Troopers. That's the magic it brings to the table. Totally worth it. Sports! We had a few sports games, but the most popular franchises were based on baseball and soccer, because that's what Japan's into. These games had a bunch of sequels and tons of replayability. Super Psychics, as the title implies, was a simple soccer game where you could play as various World Cup teams. There were four different titles, but they were essentially all the same. There was another game called Neo Geo Cup 98, The Road to Victory, but it's honestly kind of samey. Oh well. I think the sports hype in the arcade spectrum didn't last that long personally, but it's still cool to see it. Oh, did you think we were done with fighting games? Nope. This series we're about to talk about is basically the spiritual successor to Samurai Showdown. Except here's the thing. This game is probably 10,000% better than Samurai Showdown. In fact, imagine Gato Mark of the Wolves with swords and you basically have the last blade. The artwork is amazing, the fighting is fluid as hell, and the mechanics work beautifully. It got a sequel called Last Blade 2, which looked even better if you can believe that. For 1999, this game was the shot, but not a lot of people knew about it because in America it was only released in arcades and on the Dreamcast. This series, for as short as it was, is easily one of the greatest things that SNK put out in the late 90s, so snatch it up if you get a chance. Remember ADK? We mentioned them earlier, but this was their final game that they produced for the Neo Geo, and it's a shoot 'em up. But more importantly, Twinkle Star Sprites was a competitive title with you facing off against a human opponent. And instead of you simply shooting the shit out of crazy aliens or enemy planes, you were tackling these cutesy enemies. Kind of like Parodius, but not as fun because they added puzzle elements to the shooting gameplay. Another love it or hate it series. There was a sequel called Twinkle Star Sprites La Petite Princess which was somewhat of an improvement. I don't know, this game really isn't for me. I like the edgier, in-your-face SNK titles. We already covered Vanguard earlier in this episode, so we aren't going to get into too much detail here. Vanguard was a sort of technological breakthrough in the shmup genre because of many reasons. First, it has amazing music, sound effects, and voice modulation, but it also gives the player the ability to move in multiple directions, vertical, horizontal, diagonal, something we didn't really see until Salamander. It had a sequel, but good luck finding it. Great series, though. You thought the art of fighting was meant to be a clone of Street Fighter 2? Ha! Well, son, let me educate you. World Heroes Scream Street Fighter! Like, I'm pretty sure they purposely made the assets to make this game be confused with Street Fighter and arcades. Because it looks like it that much! But, yeah, it was a standard fighting game, with interesting characters such as Hanzo Hattori, Jean d'Arc, Kim Dragon, Rasputin, and Gigas! Gigas Christ? Nah, I'm only kidding. His name is Gigas, though, which is still pretty damn hilarious. This game was also pretty successful, but that's likely because of the social impact of Street Fighter 2. In World Heroes 2, we were met with all the previous characters. Then we had World Heroes 2 Jet. Stupid name, great game. Same stupid characters, but 100% fun as hell. Especially if you like Street Fighter 2 clones. The final entry was World Heroes Perfect. And boy howdy, it was the tits. This time you could fight Neo Dio and Son Goku. I swear to God, Son Goku. Now, is it the same one? Beats the fuck out of me because I've never played it, but he flies on a Nimbus cloud, so I don't know if this is some shared interest in folklore or just blatant copyright violations, but fuck it. All right, time to nerd out a little bit. So in the classic Chinese story, Journey to the West, there is a character named Sun Wukong also known as the Monkey King. That character has basically been used all over Japanese entertainment since the beginning of time. In Japanese, his name is pronounced Son Goku. This is also where the character Goku in Dragon Ball is from. And that's two things I learned today. Anyway, all the World Heroes games were simply fantastic. So, definitely check it out. And so there you have it. The history of SNK from the start, to the finish, to the unfinished, and to the might as well be finished. That's just the way it goes. 
But hey, these titles are just small samples of games that were pumped out for a powerhouse system in the 90s, in one of the most memorable times in arcade and console gaming history. From the early days of experimentation with jank-ass titles to Metal Slug, Fatal Fury, and the King of Fighters, SNK earned their name with games that would bleed you dry of quarters. But the kicker was we didn't care. These games attracted us, molded us into gamers we are today, and wasted our lives in a way that honestly, I don't think could ever be replaced. And even though their name is only whispered by the wind in terms of relevance nowadays, those memories are what we cherish the most. SNK was one of the most influential arcade developers during the 90s through their innovation, creativity, and balls to the wall fun. And that's why we challenge you guys to seek out these older titles and try to enjoy them like kids in the arcade would have 30 years ago. Who knows? Maybe you'll find something you like. I know there's plenty that I do. That was a really great episode. I thoroughly enjoyed talking about SNK. They're not as big as you would think. They just contributed heavily during one specific time frame. I guess it's like a niche market, if you will. Um, yeah, like Metal Slug for me, badass. King of Fighters, badass. I know that I'm not really good at SNK, and I might talk down upon SNK, but you cannot deny that those guys were the arcade heavy hitters during that time. They pioneered an entire you know, system with the MBS and then the AES, no matter how expensive it was. They truly brought the arcade home, which is something you didn't see very often. But anyway, thank you so much to all of my guest speakers. Thank you to everybody who helped to include Mr. Scoot. And if you like what you saw, give me a thumbs up down in the comment section below. Tell us what you want to learn about, what's, what company, franchise, or anything you would like to see an episode like this about. And we will definitely accommodate it. We've already got season two planned out, but it'll probably be season three. Who knows? But anyway, as always, from my family to your family, good energy, good vibes. Ready to go gaming show, out.